do it quick then. All right, uh, welcome uh, to the third and final real estate speaker series event. Uh, so far, we've got through how to buy a house. Uh, we, then we got through why not to start off with a single family house, use that FHA or other type of loan uh, for a du duplex, triplex, or quadplex. Uh, and now today we're going to talk about how to escape the nine to five. <laughs> all right. Uh, basically what we're all here to do basically at college is go get a nine to five, right? And it definitely plays a, uh, a very important role um, in escaping the nine to five is starting off with the nine to five. Uh, but here we have Justin Kortor. Uh, he is a living, breathing example of what we um, are here to discuss, uh, how to escape the nine to five. So without further ado, Justin Kortor. All right. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, Travis. So uh, <laughs> leave it to Travis to, uh, to invite me up here to uh, talk to you guys about leaving your nine to five when here you are paying with your time and your money to earn your nine to five. So I uh, kind of racked my head about what in the heck I'm going to talk about and how I'm going to phrase this, uh, this talk. And uh, boy, I came up with nothing. So this is going to be a question and answer. Uh, feel free to interrupt at any point. If I say something that's confusing or that you want more information, uh, definitely do not hesitate to raise your hand and, uh, and to have some interaction. That's what's going to help the person next to you and uh, really gain the knowledge from your perspective about how I can help you guys, right? The name of the game is how can I help you? Uh, so I'll just go, I'll give you a, a mile high overview of my story. Uh, born and raised in Erie, Pennsylvania, lived in New York City, lived in Philly, lived in Florida, lived in Tennessee, uh, been all over the world, traveled and uh, came back here when our Oldest daughter uh, was in first grade, had a baby right out of high school, didn't go to college. In fact, this is probably the closest I've ever gotten to college, which is kind of ironic. I sent a picture of my mom and dad so they could be proud of me. And, um, <laughs> but kind of had that upbringing, got a little bit wild, talked to Jordan and the IT department about uh, some of the common uh, history that we, he, he and I have together and just wasn't on the right path. Had a baby out of high school, moved around, came back here to Erie, Pennsylvania for a low cost of living. Uh, area, which we were talking about before. Uh, fast forward, you know, didn't have much money. I was working two jobs, worked at UPS, worked at a uh, local printing company. So I was doing that 12, 15 hours a day and uh, eventually got married to my wife uh, and we ended up having twins. So that was quite the scare, especially for somebody who didn't have any money. Um, but we kind of made an agreement, a commitment in our marriage that we wanted to have her stay at home, I would work and we would have that be our family dynamic. So found out we were having twins. Um, it was kind of chaos. Uh, we were not prepared for that mentally or financially. Uh, I don't have a big family, so uh, we didn't have the support system here in town, but we ended up uh, ha having the babies. We moved the weekend before uh, we, we gave birth to them. And then I, I, uh, I told my boss, I said, hey, I've got to put my notice in. I don't even have time to look for another job. So I, uh, over the course of three or four days, the local reps that I dealt with at one of my, at my shipping company uh, put me in touch with Jim Berlin from Logistics Plus. I'm sure many of you have heard him. And uh, I worked for Jim uh, for basically 16 years. And I remember that first phone call. Uh, we were scheduled to call whatever time it was. And I remember pacing on the, on the front porch of my trailer uh, across from Robinson, Robinson Elementary School, and I was pacing, and I was talking to him, and it was like my big opportunity, and he said, okay, why don't you come down the next day, and I'll show you around, and I'll see what kind of opportunities I have for you. Never saw a resume, never saw an application. Um, went home, you know, I was at home, I got my oversized one suit that I had, and my, my shoes, and, you know, I ran out, and I got a haircut real quick, and, you know, I was, uh, shaved my peach fuzz, and I was so excited about this big opportunity, and sure enough, I go down there the next day, and Here's Jim Berlin in a stretched out polo pair of jeans and some Pumas. And I was like, oh my goodness. So come to find out he's from Long Island. My wife's family is from Long Island. And we knew a lot of the same bakeries and bars and hangout places. And he hired me on the spot. Like I said, never saw an application, never saw a resume, but it was people skills. It was relationships. It was, I knew where he was from. He kind of knew where I was from. And I, he had four or five people give me a solid reference within a few days. So 
He didn't have a job for me. I started a uh, trucking conference for him as a trial by fire uh, experience. Went well, never did that before, but it was sink or swim, project management, right? And uh, ended up in their transportation division after that conference and ended up at Hero BX actually. So I'm sure a lot of you know Hero BX, uh, Pat Black, uh, his uh, renewable fuel company. They have a big lab here on campus. Um, pretty big, pretty big uh, footprint here in Penn State. So I worked for them for 15 years and uh, I got involved. So we, so back up a little bit, worked for them for 15 years. We continue to have children. We have five children now and uh, we are very busy, but we were still very broke because we had five children. So um, working in corporate, you know, Jimberlin, Pat Black, Hero BX, they treated me very, very well. I have zero complaints about my corporate life and my employers. Uh, made good money, had great vacation, good benefits, good work environment. And, uh, but you know what? There was always something more. There was always something that fueled the fire inside of me. And I remember from the very beginning, you know, when I was, when I was, you know, 12 years old, my dad came home and he's like, Hey, I want you to paint the back fence. I'll pay you 15 bucks. And it was a small back fence, probably just something like this. So I said, all right, dad, you got it. Well, about three days later, he came home and he saw the kid, he saw a kid back there painting the fence and I got yelled at and I said, dad, I paid the paper boy 10 bucks to paint the fence. And I got yelled at. And so I've always been a little bit entrepreneurship, you know, selling lemonade stands. And then you get into high school and you sell some other, some other things that probably aren't very uh, frowned, uh, frowned upon. But, uh, you know, you, you get that entrepreneur spirit and you start realizing like there's another way to earn money. Uh, when I lived in Philadelphia, one of my neighbors was a small entrepreneur, he owned a um, small manufacturing company made uh, refrigerator magnets for sports teams, high school teams, that stuff. And he gave me Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Who's ever read Rich Dad, Poor Dad? Okay, good, good. Have you guys at least heard of Rich Dad, Poor Dad? Everybody else? All right, Robert Kiyosaki. So that's gotta be one of your top 10 books that you should be reading. Uh, Four Hour Work Week, Tim Ferriss is another good one. But um, you know, Rich Dad, Poor Dad is a philosophy mind, mindset book. Uh, four hour work week is an actual application workbook, but for our work, or I'm sorry, uh, rich dad, poor dad changed my life. So that was 15, 20 years ago. I read that. And uh, at the time I wasn't ready to take the plunge, right? We were still trying to figure out we were young parents. We had no money. We we're living where her grandparents were. We weren't quite in Erie and uh, we just weren't settled. So, but I always, I kind of had that grocery store mentality put it in the back of my head. And I'm like, that's going to happen someday, someday, someday. I want to get in real estate. I want to do something. And um, fast forward about seven years ago, work slowed down dramatically at Hero BX. I was kind of a glorified traffic manager. I was brought on board to, all, to do all their international customs compliance stuff. So we were shipping a lot of fuel over to uh, the Netherlands, Rotterdam, Antwerp. And we were doing you know, two shipments of a million and a half gallons a, a month right here out of the Port of Erie. And uh, you know, in the winter time, when the when the St. Lawrence Seaway would freeze up, we'd ship them via rail car down to Norfolk, Virginia, and that was just an awesome thing to do. And I was responsible for vessel chartering, insurance negotiations. Uh, you know, just I always said I did all the cool stuff of international logistics, right? Well, about ten, you know, about ten years ago, or so the uh, the domestic market changed, right? There were some tariffs that were put in place. And all the international business went away and it became a domestic market. Good for our company, but it robbed me of my creative ability, right? It, it took all this international business um, thought process that was required to, to run that business and made it just into this domestic transportation role. And it just really snuffed out a lot of my creative ability. So a um, couple of years of that, I got a little stir crazy sitting in a cubicle and um, one night, my, <laughs> my wife pulled me aside and she goes, hey, let's check out um, what our friends uh, Sue and, and, and Joe bought. Uh, they bought a house. Let's go check it out on Zillow. So before bed, we looked it up and I noticed immediately about a half mile down the road, a house for about a quarter of the price. And I went, wow, that's kind of that's interesting. So I called my, my mentor at the time, who was just the janitor at my dad's, at my dad's work. And uh, he was an old Vietnam vet, came back from the war, bought a whole bunch of properties, and uh, he just renovates. He was a uh, you know, fix and flip type guy, uh, long-term rentals. He would do a lot of owner finance gigs. That was his business. But I would always talk to him about real estate and landlord war stories. And I was just really 
intrigued by, uh, by his knowledge. He had a teacher's heart, and I was very great to, to have him early in my life, and he's still around, and I, I still talk to him all the time. Um, but so I called Rich up, and I said, hey, Rich, I got this property right on Washington Street, right down the street from us, whatever. He goes, hey, I'm right here. Do you want me to, uh, want me to knock on the door? I said, yeah, go ahead and knock on the door. So he went, knocked on the door. No one was home. He goes, call him, book an appointment. So we booked an appointment that same day. We walk in and it's this old farmhouse, dilapidated. A wholesaler was actually selling it. And uh, Rich pulled me aside and he goes, hey, I know this is too big for you, but how about I give you $2,000 when this closes if I buy it? And I said, absolutely. So I went home and I felt like the best real estate investor to ever hit Erie, Pennsylvania. I told my wife, I'm like, babe, I just made $2,000 for 45 minutes worth of work. And uh, I said, I can do this again. So within two or three days, I found our first investment, single family house, 22nd Raspberry on Craigslist for $18,000. So at this same time, my wife and I, we miraculously saved $25,000 to build a barn on our property. Uh, we have 18 acres in the country, small, but we had this funky shed in the backyard that we hated. So we wanted to build a barn so we could tear down the shed. So we saved up 25,000 bucks and we could not agree on anything about this barn, right? The size of it, the placement, windows, color, how big, you name it. We were just not at peace about it within our marriage. So this was all happening at the same time. I called Rich up. I said, hey, I got this. I found this place on Craigslist. What do you think? He goes, well, that's not a bad price. It's right down the street from the other one. He goes, why don't you set up a time? We'll go walk through it. So same thing, set up a time for a couple of days down the road. And uh, the day of, I called the guy and I said, hey, just confirming our appointment, four o'clock to walk through. He goes, that's fine. I'm not going to take any less than 17.5 for it. I said, okay, you, that's fine. So uh, we walked in. I'm like, well, I just saved 500 bucks, I guess. That's cool. And um, kind of run down, but all cosmetic work. And Rich kind of gave me the nod, shook hands, and I bought that place for 17,500 bucks with that $25,000 card. So bought that. I opened up a 0% credit card through Capital One for 18 months. And I used my $25,000 and that credit card to buy it and to fix it up. About halfway through. Uh, so that was in December of 2014. That was the first property that we bought, right? February of 2014 or 2015, Rich pulls me aside. He goes, hey, you should buy another one. I'm like, oh my gosh, dude, Rich, the first house is dilapidated. It's in shambles down to studs. We're drywalling bedroom, you know, bathrooms, the whole thing. He goes, go buy another one. I said, yes, sir. Right. I didn't know what I was doing. So I trusted my, uh, trusted my mentor. So contacted Jake Schlosky, a realtor here in town, and he found me one. Now, coincidentally, at the same time, my attorney, Rich's attorney was the same as my dad's attorney and was friends with Jake. So we had this little relationship thing happening pretty much right off the bat. My, our attorney said, Hey, I'll give you $50,000. I'll give you a loan for $50,000 for a lien position on both your properties. Like, okay, cool. I still had a little bit of cash left over. I still had some credit line left over my credit card. And he was going to give me $50,000 to buy the second one and to complete the renovations on both of them was the theory. So I said, okay. So we bought that. He had lien positions. Took me about till June until the first one was rented, finished and rented. And the second one was about October between the second one was rented. That same attorney refinanced both those properties for $75,000. He had lien positions on both for $75,000. So that allowed me to pay off my credit card. Didn't pay off my 25,000, but I was fine with it. But it brought me back to a, basically a zero basis, maybe 10 to $15,000 of my own cash. Did everybody follow that? There won't be a test, but that's an important lesson there, right? All right, so. I don't want to go into all of these properties, but the important point is he find a private person financed the first two properties. Why? Because I knew them. I had rapport with them. They knew me and they knew my work ethic. They trusted my mentor who trusted me and was working with me. So that relationship is what made that business work. He continued to, he, he gave me money for my third one. And then at that point, I was comfortable enough going to a bank and asking for help on my fourth one. So I pull, I open up a line of credit, right? Here's another thing, lines of credit. Lines of credit will propel your business to achieve the goals that you can't do by saving up based off your earned income, right? Leverage, using other people's money to achieve your dreams. 
So opened up a line of credit, bought my fourth property for $25,000, put about $25,000 to $30,000 into it, cash out refinanced, paid everything off. Like, wow, that was my first real experience of getting all of my money back that I put into that property. Justin, right. can you talk real quick, uh, explain to them what a cash out refinance is? We didn't talk about that the last two weeks. Right. So cash out refinance. I'll just give you an example. So I buy a property for $25,000, right? I put $35,000 into it. I'm $60,000 into that property. I go to a bank. Usually there's a seasoning period, which is six to 12 months. Every bank is different. Six to 12 months. They want to see a lease because it was rental real estate. They want to see leases. They want to see stability. And they want to see your personal uh, financial statement. They say, okay, they send an appraisal. They, they approve you for the loan. They send an appraiser out. They appraise the building for $100,000. They gave me an 80% loan to value residential loan. They gave me $80,000. So I had $80,000. I paid off the $60,000 that I had invested. And I put $20,000 in my pocket cash out refinance. Now, that $20,000 is tax free. That's not earned income. That's not investment income. That's tax free income. And you can do that on $60,000 duplexes here in Erie, single families. And you can do that on $10 million deals down in South Miami. Yeah, but it's important now that $20,000 does not go back into technically his pocket because he wants to reinvest that. He still owes that $20,000 back. So he needs no, to no, 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 not in that example. That $20,000, oh, right? Okay. I could buy my wife a new fur coat. That is not allocated to anything. The $60,000 was my investment money. Because I paid $25,000, I, I, I invested $35,000 for my lines of credit, right? So I had $60,000 of my own debt that I used to buy, renovate, and stabilize that property. When I got the $100,000 loan, right? They gave me 80% of that. So it was an $80,000 loan, right? 80, it's called an 80% loan to value loan, right? I took $80,000, paid off the $60,000 in debt and had $20,000 tax-free in my pocket to do whatever I wanted to do with it. But don't you still, you still have to pay that money back? Not the 20. I created 20 out of nothing. That's where the cash out refinance comes from. All right. Yes. Yes, exact. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, correct. So I was on the I was on the line for eighty thousand dollars, but I created that twenty thousand dollar windfall to do nothing with tax free, and the property pays that bank note every month. So yeah, go ahead. No, you're fine. Property was valued at a hundred. Yep. And the bank was going to give me an 80% loan to value loan, residential loan. So they were going to give me 80% of whatever the value came back at, which was $80,000. Yep. Paid the $60,000 back of my own debt because I borrowed from myself, my lines of credit and my own cash. That would be equity. Yes, correct. Yep. Bank note. Yeah, but you don't really got to think about it though, because that property, as you rent it out, is going to be paying right. back that eighty thousand dollar bank note. Right. Right. Yep. <clears throat> yep. So I'm on the line for an eighty thousand dollar note, but it's long term debt. It's cheap. The property's paying for it, and I created a windfall of twenty thousand dollars. And it's not your own money. Now he has zero money in the game, and I have no money into the game because I paid off my original sixty thousand dollar investment. Make sense? Okay, so um, napkin math, when it comes to figuring out what a good deal is, right? I'll get back to some of the other examples on the portfolio and how I built and stuff, but this is good napkin math. And this is probably the one point that I should have had a PowerPoint, but I hate PowerPoints, so I didn't get one. So napkin math. So when it comes to investment real estate, you need to know your market rents. You can't underwrite a deal if you don't know your market rents, okay? So find out your market rents. You can go to Zillow, you can call a realtor, you can call an experienced landlord. We've got a great local Facebook group here, Erie PA Real Estate Investors Group. 
generally any decent city will have similar groups. So I'm sure a lot of you guys aren't from Erie, but wherever you're from, um, type in city and real estate investors group, and I'm sure you'll find one. Find out what your local rents are, right? So napkin math. So let's just say that property that I gave you the example on was $1,000. That building was gonna bring in $1,000, right? You have to know what your taxes are, what your insurance is, any utilities that you're gonna pay, whether it's landscaping, water, sewer, garbage, public utilities, there's a common lighting, whatever that is, right? You wanna save eight to 10% maintenance, eight to 10% CapEx, five-ish percent for vacancy, right? Income minus those expenses equals net operating income. Net operating income minus your debt equals your cash flow. Again, I gave you guys numbers in the air, but I'd be happy to write that down for anybody afterwards. All right. That cash flow, your goal should be any investment real estate, $100 per door cash flow per property. Now, some of you are like, 100 bucks. Oh my gosh, that's a lot of BS just for $100 per door. Right. But you've got the triple crown of real estate investing. You've got cash flow, right? You've got debt pay down, right? From paying off those notes, paying off that $80,000 note, and you have appreciation, right? You guys know what appreciation is, right? Appreciation, depreciation, right? We don't necessarily have that in Erie, but we have high cash flow. We are a low cost to entry, high rents investment city, which creates cash flow, right? We've got a couple of people from LA that we were talking about. That is a high cost to entry, kind of low rents, which kills cash flow. But what do they have? Appreciation, right? I know friends in Denver, Colorado. I know friends in LA, New York City, Houston, right? They'll buy a property with almost negative cash flow so they can sit on it for two, three, four years and reap huge returns just based on appreciation. Now that is a major speculative play. Yeah. <laughs> but, it, but it happens every single day. And if you have the investment tolerance to handle that, then there's certainly nothing wrong with it. How did I escape nine to five? Cash flow. Right? Now, I don't average $100 per door. I have 140 apartments, 10 Airbnbs. And I would say on average, my apart, I'm probably 70 to $80 per door if I had to average it out cash flow per month. Now I'm leveraged. I never put a dime of my own money back into my business since that initial $25,000. Pretty good bid, right? Right? So how do you do that? Earned income. Your earned income is the number one asset that you have going for you. You guys are all here growing your education, growing your relationships, achieving what should be a lucrative career somewhere. We were talking before. I know it appears that it's hard to find a job. It's hard to find a good opportunity. There are opportunities everywhere, right? We can only control two things in life, how you respond and your effort. How you respond and your effort are the only two things that you can control in your lives, right? Grow your relationships. Talk to people. I can tell you, I've talked to hundreds of business owners and they're like, if I could just find work ethic, if I could find intellectuals, if I can find people who are punctual, people who actually want to put forth good effort and achieve something for themselves, you will find high paying jobs. Now more than ever, now jobs are paying high in the skilled workforce. Another thing we were talking about before, Erie is a tourism and hospitality town, just like a lot of these old Rust Belt towns. And unfortunately those fields don't pay on the service level. Upper management, maybe, IT management, construction management, you know, project management, probably, right? But 
business, finance, right? Law. You nail down certain skill sets, you'll always have a job. And if you can't find a job, you can make a job, right? Be a partner. How can you add value to people? How can you add value to somebody like me? How can you add value to somebody like Nick Scott or Pat Black? That's how you build those relationships. You know, you impress other people and they start opening doors for you because they don't want to do the work. And if you're willing to do the work and they trust you, <laughs> then they're going to let you do the work for them, which starts opening those doors. Right. It's all about relationships. Network, network is your net worth. You know, you've heard me say that plenty of times before, um, but it's all about relationships, all about networks. You know, if he didn't have those relationships that he had, no one's going to give him those $50,000. And who's going to reach in their pocket and give $50,000 to someone they don't like? And that wasn't even a relationship I knew I had. It was leveraging somebody else's relationship. So don't think that you need the relationship. You just need to know the person with the relationship. And if you can prove to them that you're willing to do the work, that you're willing to show up every day, take effort, someone will hang a plaque with you, right? Someone will support you, right? So, Earned income. We'll go back to that. I know we kind of got off track. Earned income, right? What does the bank want to see in a lender or in a borrower? Stability, right? They want to see stability. I always joke that it's funny. As a business owners, it's a double-edged sword. We pay CPAs to reduce our income, and then we <laughs> ask banks to borrow money, and they're like, you have no income. <laughs> like, well, of course we don't have income. Don't you know how this is played? <laughs> right? So... Your earned income will be the greatest asset that you have going into these business opportunities. He's talking about W-2. W-2 earned income. Correct. Correct. I mean, K-1 investment income, that's cool too. That shows that you've got experience, which carries some weight in the investment world, in the banking world. But W-2 income, right? I was at my job 15 years, right? I had five children. I was from here. I was good at not name dropping, but I was good at relationship bridges, right? Hey, you're this person, this person. Hey, this is my father, this is my uncle. Hey, we did this, this, this. And I was really, really good, and I still am, about bringing people together. I'm a good networker, right? I connect people, right? There's value there, right? How do you bring value to people? Bring value to people by helping them achieve their goals, right? It can't be all about you, right? Hey, what can I do to help you? What can I do to help? What can I do to help? That's how you grow. That's how you grow a business, right? But those banks want to see earned income. They want stability in their borrowers. I knew at an early age in my investment career, I needed to be the best borrower that my banker could present to its board, right? And I made sure I was organized. I had all my crap on Excel. I had personal balance sheets that I've updated once a month. Like I just, I kind of geeked out on data, right? Data is valuable whether it's your own data, business data, commercial data, social data, whatever it is. Cre be a master of your own data, right? Download Credit Karma. Know where you're at from a credit standpoint, right? You need to be able to present yourself in the best manner possible, right? Have a decent credit score. You know, you don't need a, you don't need a down payment, but you need to be able to present yourself as a borrower so they feel safe enough to give that to you. Don't be afraid to have a cosigner. Have a guarantor, have a parent do it, right? You could do it that way. You know, now we're starting to talk about how do you get started in this, right? I think Billy talked about first time home buyer, right? Get involved in that. How, who is here for Billy's talk? All right, about half the room. So I'm good friends with Billy. I know he looks 12 there. He's actually 14. <laughs> but uh, no, Billy's a good guy. He runs a... Um, he is a partner in his parents' insurance company, and he's a hustler. I mean, he's one of the, he's a, also a master networker, knows a lot of people, knows how to connect people, and he provides a tremendous amount of value in his service, right? But he talked about how do you get started? House hack, right? First time home buyer, Freddie Mae, Fannie Mac, FHA, talk about, or they cover one to four unit buildings, single families duplexes, 
triplex, quadplex, right? Anything four unit and under, four unit and under will qualify for traditional residential financing. 80%, sometimes 85%, if you can find a good broker, rates are going up, so it may be a little bit more of a challenge, but that money is available, right? And if we're talking cash flow, long-term cheap debt boosts cash flow, right? Usually they wanna see you living in one of the units. So focus on a two, three, four unit. If you can live for free, great. If you can make some money off it, even better. If you have to pay hundred bucks, 200 bucks a month, no big deal. You're gaining an asset, you're gaining experience, being a landlord, being a real estate investor in the eyes of banks and private investors, right? People are gonna invest with you if they know that you can be a good steward of that money, right? So fast forward, it took me about six years, got about 120 units, left my job March 1st of last year, 2021 from Hero BX. Raised at that time, a little over $2 million, probably close to 3 million bucks privately, right? Between all the investments that we had. Bought the properties, cash out refinance, did that same gig, the 100,000 with the 80,000, did that dozens and dozens of times. Sometimes you make a lot of money, sometimes you break even. The goal should always be to go to closing without any money out of your pocket. That should always be the goal, right? So left my job about 120 units and it was because of the private individuals that I borrowed money from, right? I have four main guys that I borrow money from. One is a retired real estate investor who was a mailman his whole life, did very, very well, sold all of his properties. Now he lends money on a short-term basis called hard money lending. Loan, think of a loan shark, right? I got another guy, same thing. Uh, entrepreneur his whole, his whole life, owned a furniture company, owns a car lot, owns a couple of different investments, was a home builder, all different types of businesses. He also lends short-term, right? Hard money lender, loan shark. Then I have my attorney who will lend long-term, right? He'll lend me long-term, same, same private lending, hard money, but it's long-term. When I say short-term, six to 12 months. When I say long-term, five, 10, 15 years, longer amortization schedules, 15, 20, 30 year amortization schedule, depending on the money. Then I have another guy, retired business owner, sold his company 10 years ago for $27 million, third generation engineer, sold it to a, uh, one of his main customers in Germany, 27 million bucks. Long-term, right? There's a whole demographic of American out there where too much money is actually a problem, right? They need a place to park their cash. They don't wanna deal with six to 12 month turns of their money, right? These loan sharks, they're getting 10%, 10, I'm sorry, 10 points, 10% 10 interest on their money. Okay, so if I borrow $100,000, they're gonna give me $100,000, but my note is gonna be $110,000, 10 points. Make sense? They're also gonna charge me 10% interest on that money on the 110,000 for six to 12 months, depending on how we negotiate the deal. It's all deal specific. I just want to take a second to add some. I know a couple of the guys that he's talking about, and I didn't know them. Those two of those guys actually ended up approaching me based off of them hearing about me in the real estate investment kind of world. Um, so the reason I bring that up is just because of how important your um, personal brand. Yeah, your, your personal brand is. Your reputation is so, so important. People know about you when you don't even know about them. All right, so you got to keep that reputation sparkling clean. Key thing about being Penn Staters, integrity, doing the right thing when no one is looking, when no one is watching, just doing the right thing. People see that even though you don't see them seeing you and uh, they notice and that rep your reputation precedes you. And you got to keep that sparkling clean. I had two of those guys walk up and just say, hey, how much money do you want? <clears throat> I don't even know. Them. Right. So that happens every day. 
right? Your actions speak louder than words, as I say, right? Um, so short-term, long-term, right? Two different types of money. And you've got institutional debt. You've got banker's debt, right? I hate dealing with banks, despise banks, despise lenders, despise brokers. I hate them all. Private people, it's you and me doing a deal together. You're investing with me. I'm investing with you, right? It's a relationship thing. Go to Eaton Park, have, a, have dinner, have a cup of coffee, present a deal. Where can I wire the money? That's the type of deal that you want. Those are the type of relationships that you're trying to form, right? These are investors that understand alternative investments. They understand crypto. They understand small business. They understand real estate. They understand commodities, metals. They understand that there's a world out there outside of the traditional boring stock market, right? They're accredited, right? I'm sure you guys have heard of accredited investors, right? They can invest in publicly traded securities, right? Outside of this one to four unit business that we're talking about, you start talking about 10 to $20 million complexes, you get into what's called a syndication. And those syndications are actually LLC partnerships that create a registered security and they crowd raise, right? You can crowd raise $10 million to go buy a complex, right? It's better to own 10% of a watermelon than 100% of a grape, right? How do you get involved in some of these big projects? That's how you do it. Find the deals, find the money, be the IT guy. What value do you bring to a partnership? Take an inventory of your own assets and your own abilities. Be transparent with yourself, be humble with yourself. What, do I, what can I bring to the table to help a real estate investor? How do I get involved in real estate on a bigger level? That's how you do it. What do you bring to the table, right? Single families are cute and they're sexy and they're low, you know, low management. But at $100 per door, like my example, that's 1,200 bucks a year cash flow. What happens if a furnace craps the bed? Well, there's 3,000 bucks. Hot water tank, well, there's 1,000 bucks. You kill your cash flow. If you don't have appreciation, boy, it's a tight stretch. So my first three properties were all single families because that's what my mentor invested. He only has single family properties. I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to do what Rich does. I'm, I, don't know, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I'm going to listen to Rich. So I bought my first three single family properties. Eventually, I was like, shit, I don't make any money. I'm going to go buy a two unit. All right. So I bought a string of two units. I was like, huh, that's all right. I'm going to go buy three unit, four unit. So then I went, bought a whole string of three units to four units. And, and that's really smart too, because when you have your location, you have more units in a centralized location, that moves you further down your long run average cost curve, right? Because you don't have to spend a lot of time traveling between the properties. Something happens at one property, well, you can take care of other things that are wrong at the other properties right. while you're there. So your average cost goes down greatly when you kind of centralize your properties. Uh, so uh, when you're thinking about investing, you want to try and get them all in one area right. initially because uh, it greatly decreases your cost. All right. So that kind of leads into something else that I was kind of cued to talk about, but I was just kind of seeing where this goes. I had a full-time corporate job. I had five kids. I was what you would call busy, right? You know, they always say, if you want something done, give it to a busy person, right? So how the heck did I do that? Well, I bought those first couple. I was still working corporate, obviously, at the time. I left corporate at 120 units. So when I was doing it at the very beginning, I have a whole chapter of my life called Lowe's Opens at 6 a.m., <laughs> right? Lowe's Open at 6 a.m., I was at Lowe's. I woke up early, spent two hours at the projects. Sometimes I'd shower at the projects, go to work. I'd take an hour, hour and a half, sometimes two hours at my lunch break, go work on the properties. After work, I'd cut out probably a little too early at times, go work on the properties. And I was home by 5.30, six o'clock sometimes, right? I would do that Monday through Friday, and I would work till noon on Saturdays. I'd wake up, same thing, six o'clock, be at Lowe's, 
do my returns, do my purchases, be home by noon. My dad would always bring lunch over on Saturdays. So that was my stopping point. And I wouldn't work on Sundays. I just needed a break. And I was fulfilled knowing that was the most amount of time I could throw at this project at the side business, right? Because I had a family, right? Everybody talks about balance, balance. I want to be balanced. I want to be balanced. Well, screw balance, but there's also burnout, right? I knew that that was as much as I could possibly put forward into this without losing my mind and losing my family. And my wife will tell you that she was always impressed with that balance, right? I seemed to have the balance to do that. Now, I ain't going to lie to you. I was burnt out a lot of the time. I may not have been emotionally as present as I wanted to be, right? But it was a short period of time for a lifetime of freedom, basically. A little sacrifice goes a long way. It took me six years to get to 120 units to leave my job, right? And it was that schedule. Early mornings, lunch breaks, after work, Saturday mornings, right? Did it all myself until about 60 to 70 units. Started hiring some 1099 carpenters, right? I, I, uh, I was using some cloud-based property management software that really put out a lot of fires for me on my day-to-day -day operation. It allowed me to manage my property from my phone, <laughs> from my corporate desk, from my, my home office, right? Hired a couple 1099 people. That really propelled my business. Fast forward to, well, I should say, huh, about 65 to 70 is when I started Stonehouse Management Company with a guy, with a banker who opened up all my lines of credit at Key Bank, Dan Continenza. We invested in some expensive property management system, software, and that really allowed us to blow up, right? Processes and systems. I'm a big process and systems guy, right? I have problems. I create a process to solve that problem. So I never deal with that problem again, right? You've got to be efficient with your time. You've got to be efficient with the systems and your management system and how you solve your problems, right? That's, that's not foreign. That, that could be to anything, not just real estate investing. Banking, finance, teaching, personal life. I mean, you always have problems. You got to solve the problems. If you still have the same problems you're dealing with from five years ago, you've got a bigger problem, right? Green and growing, not red and ripe. You need to be evolving. You're, the goal is never the avoidance of problems, right? You're always going to have problems in your life. You're fighting and you're working to pick the problems you want to have, to pick the problems that you want to work on, right? We all have talent and ability. Everybody here is different. We all shine in a different area, right? We have 24 hours a day, just like Elon Musk has 24 hours a day. He has just uber defined what he's efficient as, and that's the lane he's in. And he's able to utilize his 24 hours in a very efficient manner. And when I was doing my mornings, lunches, and afternoons, I knew every minute what I was doing when I was at that property because I didn't have time, right? You don't have the time, you spend the money. If you don't have the money, you spend the time. I had to be efficient with my time. I knew that I only had X amount of hours a day to throw up my hustle, my side gig. So I had to know what I was doing with each minute there. In the mornings when I was at Lowe's, I would do my returns and I would go buy my list, leave, do my job, right? Next morning at Lowe's, that was my routine, right? You might if I yeah, jump through. in? So one thing he said, I talked about this briefly, maybe in one of your classes, uh, sometimes they all blur together a little bit, um, but what he was uh, talking about 60 to 70 units when he started hiring additional people. And that's when his business really, really took off, right? I was just like that the exact same way. I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. I can do it all. Okay. But you only have 24 hours a day personally. Well, no, you don't because you can buy other people's hours. Yeah. So as long as you're able to pay those people's hours for less than what you're going to make, then you're freed up all your time. There's a great book that just came out by Dan Sebin called Who Not How. It's an orange book. It talks exactly that thought process. How do, you, how do you analyze what you're good at and what you're efficient at and what you should be focused on? And then also what you suck at and what you hate. <laughs> and identifying other personalities 
that shine in those areas. Comparative advantage, back to chapter two. There you go, right? That's business. That's human capital, right? We are all who's and we are all how's to different people, right? Right now, I'm a who to Travis and to you guys, right? I'm sorry, I'm a how, right? I'm a how. You guys are trying to learn from me, right? How do I do this? Get Justin up there to teach you. Here we're at, right? Right? If I want to hire a property manager, you know, I take an analyze. I'm like, oh man, we're too busy. We're not running apartments fast enough. We're not doing this. I need a apartment manager. Who can I hire to, for my property manager, right? I go through my list of people that I know, people I interact with, people who have shown interest, people who want to learn. Those are the people you talk to first, people that are hungry, people that are already in your sphere of influence, right? Who, not how, right? That's how you build companies. That's how you build businesses. You know, you want a big boy, big girl business, you employ people. Yeah, and, and that's the next um, Robert Kiyosaki's book, uh, The Four Cash Flow Quadrants, yeah. which is the next one after Rich Dad, Poor Dad. So the four cash flow quadrants are employee, all right, and then a sole business owner where you do all the work, and then a small business owner where you start hiring employees, and then the investor where you just invest your money. Right. So uh, that's the next book to check out. If those of you already read Rich Dad Poor Dad, uh, the four cash flow quadrants. Yeah. I'm Lifestyle design that. is the goal, right? Can't trade your hours for your dollars. Trade your hours for dollars if you're trying to design a lifestyle, right? You do that by implementing different streams of income in your life. Business income, investment income, passive income. W-2 income, right? Not W-2 <laughs> income. You got to start it. You got to. But you have to start there. That is your greatest asset for starting any business or any opportunity is your W-2 income. The more streams of income you have, right? You know, no one wants to go thirsty, right? Well, if you have multiple streams of income, you'll never go thirsty. Yeah. What's up, man? So, did you ever, because um, it sounds like focus on the client. So, <laughs> I attempted to get into flips, but once they're all fixed up and perfect and done, I fall in love with them and I just hold them. <laughs> and I've never sold them. So, in my opinion, I have a flip right now that I know I'm going to be well, that I should be selling, but I'm probably not going to. Is that the and stud? Probably, is that the stud one? Yeah, yeah, I'm probably just going to rent it because that's just the sap that I am. Right? If it's all fixed, it's never going to break. Why would you sell it? That's yeah. how I look at it. I just and, can't and, get over that. And huh. why would you sell something that's going to constantly be putting money in your pocket? Right. right? You the know, acquisition is always the hardest part. Yeah. Like when you when you have when you own the house, it's going to give you a paycheck every week. If you sell the house, you get a paycheck once and that's it. You got to start working again. And you get taxed on that on a short-term capital gains. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. Oh, of course. I mean, sometimes you eat the bear, sometimes the bear eats you. I mean, it's not a perfect business, um, but I will say that is a very small portion of my experience, right? Because you need to be educated. I had proper guidance. I read all the books, right? I didn't do it alone, right? Don't be afraid to get a men to pay for a mentor, pay for a coach, right? I don't care if it's me, if it's him, if it's somebody else. You can't do it alone. You need somebody that you can call 20 times a day with every stupid question that you think of, right? That was me. I called, my, I called Rich 100 times a day. As the months went on, got fewer, fewer, fewer. Now it'll go a month or two before we talk, right? And I have new mentors, right? You'll outgrow mentors in your life. And not just business, but in your faith, in your family, in school, right? Professors. Everybody has a mentor. And if you don't think you have a mentor, you may even have negative mentor influence. Everybody allows noise into their life, right? You've 
got to be able to discern the good people versus the bad people in your life. All right, so we got about 10 minutes left. I'd love to answer questions. If you guys have any specific questions, let it rip. Yeah. Any traditional insurance company will help. Call Billy. He'll, he'll hook you up. It, it doesn't need to be anything fancy. When you get into Airbnb, sometimes there's some nuances that you got to be aware of, but don't, let, don't allow that to be a stumbling block. That's a very easy problem to solve. And it's cheap. It's not, it's not like you're paying an arm and a leg for extra insurance. And not only that, if you do the traditional route with the FHA, your insurance will be included in your escrow. So you actually only get one bill every month that pays for your principal on the loan, the interest on the loan, your homeowner's insurance, your taxes. So you, that all gets combined into one bill uh, when you have a mortgage uh, on the property. Who's next? Yes. Who, not how? Rich dad, poor dad. Rich dad, poor dad. Four work. hour work week. Oh, there. Tim Ferriss, four hour work week. Yep. 12 Pillars by Jim Rohn would be another one. That's, that's another good one. Who's next? Yes. How to get a credit card? So here's a, here's a little hack. For all of you who have excellent relationships with your parents and who trust you, <laughs> they can add you as a non-designated signee on their credit cards for free. Don't screw it up. You can't screw it up. Whatever you do will not affect them. Whatever they do will not affect, well, it will affect you. But if they have aged credit cards, right? Talk about credit. Credit age is a factor in your credit score. You've got parents that have credit cards that are 15, 20, 30 years old, and they've got good credit. If they add you as a non-designated signer, on those credit cards, that credit history will transfer to you at the next update. And it's free. That's, so, I mean, that's a hard conversation to have. However, the non, -des I, the non designated signer is that, that they can't use the credit card at all. They can't not sign get a for the card. credit card. You will it's not just, get a credit card. Literally, literally, it's just your name on it. That's all it is. That right. is a legacy wealth hack for yep. families. Mm hmm. To achieve generational wealth. Yep. I mean, I think that there's stipulations that you've got to live there for a year and a day. Unless you. No unless, one's going to check on you, though. Yeah. Yeah. No, no one should check on you. But if you're yeah. not living there and you're renting it out, you're breaking the law. Um, so don't they could call the loan. Worst case scenario, they call the loan. Yeah, that means you got to pay back the loan, aka sell your house, and yeah. you're going to lose all your closing costs, et cetera, et cetera. Hey, dude, up top, real quick. Did that answer your question? I don't want to, I don't want to undermine what you asked. Did that answer your question? Yeah, that's fine. Hmm. Credit, right? Credit makes the world go around. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, it, it most certainly has. First trying to get into it, so maybe wait to no, really don't wait. Nope. Prices are constantly going to change. You just need to act. Yeah. Maybe. If you're mentally prepared to do it and you've got the right support, do it. Act. Don't try to time the market. That's called timing the market. And you, okay. you always lose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So your greatest investment will always be investing in yourself, right? So don't hesitate to go to conferences, go to masterminds. To that's surround what you're yourself. doing here at college is investing in yourself. Yeah, exactly. Same thing. Right. So would I recommend you start? I mean, I know hundreds of college kids that have started real estate investing, right? That's certainly not a foreign concept, right? I know some college derelicts that got a whole bunch of grant money. And instead of putting that on school, they went out and they bought properties. Is that right or wrong? It's a gray area. It's a gray area, right? Knowledge, education, especially now there's so much free education out there regarding real estate investing. Surround yourself with your demographic of college, young entrepreneur, young professional who is starting these things. Talk to them, see what they're doing. You know, you could talk about self-directed IRAs. You could talk about, you know, matching 401ks. Like you get yourself into a nice company and they do a match. Well, of course, don't piss away a free match, right? But then take all the other money and invest it in yourself. Buy books, read books, go to conferences, go to masterminds, right? Get a mentor, whatever you got to do. I don't think they know what a mastermind is. You want to tell them what a mastermind is? So mastermind is a... Napoleon Hill is a concept coined by Napoleon Hill back in the 20s. And it's where two minds are gathered, a third power is created, right? So you get into a room, this would be considered somewhat of a mastermind, right? Travis and I are having a conversation about real estate investing, and you guys are all listening to that conversation. That would be a mastermind right? You're learning from other people's experiences, right? You're getting an intimate relationship with people that are where you want to be. What value can we bring to you? What value can you bring to us? Right? What if one of you guys are like, hey, my grandparents own four properties and they, they're looking for somebody to buy it. They don't want to put it on the market. Would you be interested? Sure. Why don't we buy them? Oh, they happen to be 10 unit complexes. Why don't we form a partnership, right? How do you bring value to me? How do I bring value to you? And how do we grow as a team, as a whole, as opposed to the individual? We need people. You can't do everything yourself. Right. Yes. It would boost your credit score. Yeah, it will boot. The goal is to boost your credit yeah. and to become a better borrower in the eyes of a traditional lending institute. Well, let's say, like, has a mm -hmm. It wouldn't affect theirs, but it would affect yours in a positive way. In a positive way. Yeah. Because you would, their credit history, it all depends. It all depends on their credit limit. It all depends on length. It's, it's, it all depends. There's like seven or eight different factors that'll play with. I don't even know if that's, yeah, I don't know, but that does happen. Yeah. Yeah. So I bought, <clears throat> I bought a triplex 614 East 10th street, big yellow, ugly thing has six garages in the back. I call them murder shacks because they're scary. <laughs> I bought it from a wholesaler for $19,000. He bought it from the seller for $15,000. Now this place, family owned it for uh, 40, 40 years, something like that. And they had punched holes in all the walls so all the family could get to each unit together. They were no longer independent units. Follow me? Mm -hmm. Bought it for $19,000. Pulled my lines of credit. I don't even know how much money I put into it. 40,000, something like that. I think, probably, I think I was all in for $55,000, maybe $60,000. <clears> Fixed it all up, separated the units, right? Got the, got the electric meters, got the water meters, the backflow, all that crap. Cash out refinance and I broke even, right? Paid off all the debt that I had. I generate out of that property about $500 a month cash flow just from the property. 
I rent out each of the garages at the time for 50 bucks a month. Now they're up to 60 and $70 a month. And then I bought a Polaris Ranger side-by-side -side for $200 a month off that garage income. Yeah. So again, this all happened between six, about six years between, you know, six years previous. Some things have changed, but most of my properties came from off-market opportunities, not MLS. We were talking before, once a property hits the MLS, it's a cesspool, it's a shark frenzy. Especially in today's market. I mean, any house that's listed and it's listed at even close to market price, it's gone in the day. Yeah, and it's probably overbid at that yep. point. Most houses right now are going, if they're decent houses, are going for 10, 20% over asking price. Have you guys heard the term wholesaler? Wholesaler, right? Kind of like a private broker. Yeah, we haven't talked about that much at all. They go find the deals and then they send the deals out to their list of buyers. Well, I was on this guy's list of buyers. He reached out to me. He knew I could close the deal and, he, and we closed it. So basically what wholesaling is, he wants to sell his house off market. I come in, I say, hey, I'll give you $50,000 uh, to buy this house. I put it under contract. I'm going to buy your house for $50,000. I then go sell my contract to me for, for, for $60,000. I make $20,000. The buyer 10, gets, his, gets his 10,000 and okay. he gets his house. Just a math guy. You don't, you never even own the property. Right. You're selling your interest in that contract. <laughs> You're selling a contract. So in that instance, my friend made $4,500. I paid nineteen five for it. Anyone else have any questions? Yeah. In theory, if that should be the, the goal. value enough, that should be the goal. Yep. Yep. Well, no. So. Uh, <laughs> so I don't, so he asks, so he asked me, do I try to get out of the bank debts? Cause I hate banks. Banks are a necessary evil, right? They provide you with long-term in theory, cheap debt, right? Like I was saying before about the private investors, some of those guys are charging you 10%, 10 points. That's expensive debt, but I can close on a deal next week. Yes. That gives me the ability to be very aggressive with cash offers. I can make you a cash offer, no contingencies, close next week. That's pretty attractive to a motivated seller versus, hey, I'll pay, you know, say that $100,000 house. I can make somebody an aggressive cash offer for 80, 82, 60 even, cash, close next week, no contingencies. Versus somebody who's going to come in and say, well, I'm going to give you 90,000, but I have to contingent on financing. I'm going to have a rate on inspection. I'm going to have a structural inspection and I want to snake all the sewer lines. And uh, it's probably going to take three months. How's that for an attractive deal? Not attractive, right? But say you want to get out of town. You want to sell the house. You're not emotionally involved. You just want out. Cash offer next week is pretty attractive. It also, so, it also gets you around kind of the credit issues that you were talking about. If you're paying cash or trying to cash, the yeah, credit's not but even. It's, that's but when, you're short. kicking the can down the line. Yeah. Because you have to be able to refinance it. Very confident in your ability to refinance that expensive debt into long-term bank debt. Like I said before, the acquisition is always the hardest part. Once you have the asset, you control the asset, it's stable, you're running that asset, then you could take it to a bank and who cares if it takes two to three months? Because you control it. You're not waiting to close. You don't have, you know, it's a Back lot more manageable. Deal. Right. But when you're borrowing expensive debt, you've got to have a plan to get out of it as soon as possible into long-term bank debt. Yeah, and back to what his, the, the original question is, do you want to get out of a 30-year note at 3%? No. Not if it's making 12%. Yeah. 
Yeah, right. Cash flow, right? Cheap bank debt creates cash flow. No, you're fine. Mm -hmm. Right. Just being quick with your cash offers. That's the only ability. You could be very aggressive with a cash offer versus contingent upon financing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gotta, gotta start somewhere. Just start. Yeah, find deals. Get familiar with your market. Start calling people. You know, you see those bandit signs, right? Get get in a room with other people your age doing some crazy shit, and you'll start realizing what you're able to, and it'll become a game and it'll be really fun. And if you find deals, you can sell them to guys like me and make five, 10, 15 grand without off a wholesale. Deal. Without even owning anything, without any of your money. Hey guys, we're just about wrapped up. If any of you guys want to reach out to me, you can find me on Facebook very, very easily. I'm very active, Justin Coratory. Um, I'll put my, that's my name. Just look me up on Facebook, shoot me a message. Hey, I saw you at Penn State and uh, I'd love to connect, okay? If you have it. Thanks guys.